In this uh, final summation panel, uh, we're dealing with what uh, may be the most in important issue in U.S.-Chinese affairs, which is the uh, future of United States and Chinese cultural relations. Uh, and the reason uh, cultural relations are so seminally significant is that all other issues are ramifications of how our two peoples and our two governments look at each other. Uh, if countries and their respective peoples cannot respect each other, uh, there can be no sustaining relationship, whatever the policies of two governments may be at a moment in time. Uh, in this context, uh, it strikes me that there are three phenomena that are self-evident. Uh, one is that the most important bilateral relationship in this century and quite possibly in this millennium uh, will be the United States-Chinese relationship. Uh, if it's constructive, we're looking at the potential of an era of, of uh, potential peace and prosperity, and if not, uh, the reverse could well be the case. Uh, secondly, uh, the world is hallmarked by change in its acceleration. And while uh, much of recorded history has been repetitive with revolutions involving change back to circumstances that existed before, uh, now the unknown and the unexperienced is the norm. And so thirdly, uh, the most unprecedented aspect of all of this change that we see around us uh, relates to advances in science and technology. Uh, and the most so sobering uh, relates to their ramifications for military hardware. Uh, and that means that in many ways the, the most profound political science observation of the last century comes from Einstein, uh, who once commented that splitting the atom had changed everything uh, except our way of thinking. Uh, and what's sobering about this is that uh, to the degree that uh, history remains a, a, a partial guide. Uh, a conflict can be noted as a constant, and presumably because human nature is a conflict. And so how we think about things uh, has never mattered more. And so the question that has to be addressed is, uh, how can uh, the instinct for conflict be contained? And it would appear that the only uh, optimistic uh, response would be that human nature has to change or we have to understand human nature in a much deeper way in order to develop techniques to better direct uh, human beings themselves. So what are the guides to this task? Uh, and history is one, although the more unprecedented the circumstance, uh, the less sure a guide history is. Uh, literature is another and probably literature uh, is uh, better suited to uh, having people uh, uh, place themselves in the imaginative capacity to put themselves in other people's shoes than almost any other art form. And thirdly, we have philosophy. And I just want to say, in the context of U.S. and Chinese relations, uh, one of the most optimistic similarities uh, uh, truly demands attention. And that is, in the Judeo-Christian world, uh, there's a great deal of emphasis on the concept of rights, but there's a moral underpinning, uh, uh, underpinning which relates to the golden rule, which is, of course, that uh, we should do unto others as we want others to do unto us. Uh, in the Confucian tradition, uh, there's a similar but less obtrusive uh, framing of this golden rule, which is the doctrine of Shaw which in effect says that one should not do unto others what one would not want others to do unto themselves. Uh, and I, I mention these universal principles because while differences in cultures are, are likely to remain, and while differences in self-interest are almost certainly going to be the case, and while the Chinese might like us to be more Confucian, and we might like the Chinese to be more Jeffersonian, uh, there is no reason whatsoever that there cannot be an expansion of uh, mutual respect. And so it's in the context of the question of how you advance respect uh, that this final uh, uh, panel has been convened. And I will uh, introduce uh, each of the speakers in their order in which I would hope they would speak. And the first will be Lu Menxi, who's director of the Institute of Chinese Culture, 
Uh, the second will be Allison Blakely, who's a professor of European and Comparative History at Boston University. Uh, the third will be Jin Sun Rong, who's vice dean of the School of International Relations at Renmin University of China. And the last will be Josiah Ober, who's a professor of classics and also professor of political science at, at Stanford University. Uh, and so with that as a background and as an introduction, uh, I would also say that, that in, in this summation uh, panel, we have had a uh, contraction in time uh, with great uh, restraints uh, uh, relating to uh, travel of, of a number of people here. Uh, and it's awfully awkward, I think, when people travel long distances not to give uh, full addresses, but I'm asking everyone to stick with 10 minutes. Uh, and if it goes beyond that, I have a clock. I'm, I'm going to raise my hand and ask people to, to summarize uh, within a minute or so, if, 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 if that's uh, possible. Uh, and so let me begin uh, uh, with Lu Min Shi uh, and ask him to address this, this panel, please. Thank you, Chairman. Today, I am a supporting role. My specialty is uh, literature and history, especially the Chinese kind. I'm not specialized in um, Chinese-U.S. relations. But all intellectuals, all scholars, this is something very important to them. I think uh, among Chinese intellectuals, they have great expectations for the relationship. Um, I, we want it to be healthy and beautiful. In the past three decades, um, in Chinese families, we don't have the exact figures. I don't know how, ma how many of them came. Their, their children came to study and work in large numbers. Since 1972, the relationship had um, very nice periods, but we don't know why. It's, uh, the relationship is like a, um, a couple. They, they fight all the time uh, with no reasons. And you try to find out why, and there's nothing. But they're just <laughs> arguing and fighting, and they're smashing things. And they, they threaten divorce. In the reality, in honesty, I can't really see, uh, notwithstanding all the differences in politics, I can't really see lots of differences, um, fundamental differences. But what kind of relation? We have had very close relationships um, among, well, our Chinese in scholars. We have, we have, a, we have problems. Um, you know, we see problems in our own country, but, but um, our counterparts uh, like, like those places. Uh, where does the instability come? It's not, I think it's more lack of understanding on the American side of Chinese personality and, and culture and history. I don't understand why. Um, of course, the polit politicians don't interact much with, uh, with our scholars. Why do they see us as a threat? <laughs> In our history, we never threatened anyone. We never uh, uh, played uh, aggression. We were never aggressive. We had Yuan di dynasty we, when we were very strong. When we dealt with our relations with the barbarians, we sent our beautiful women to them to make peace with them. In Tang Dynasty, it was a glorious time in our history of great diversity culturally. We had a strong country. At that time, as you know, we sent another princess to Tibet. I remember, I recall in the past couple of days, um, you know, um, the American 
uh, now near China when the, China, when the country was weak. But we had strong periods and we send our people to other countries. This is our history. I, I don't, so I study history. I don't remember any, his, any time in our history that we threatened America, England, Italy, France, Holland, never. This is a hypothesis uh, with no ground. It's a wrong hypothesis that China would be American's enemy. That's wrong, my friends. We're friends. As you can see this morning, the scholars' presentations, the theater expert, although I'm not specialized in theater, everybody likes theater. She talked about Ying Ruocheng. I do know him. He, his English was wonderful. He was a wonderful actor and director and cultural ambassador. He was remarkable. He loved American culture and Chinese culture. Professor O Jiamin um, talked about uh, dance exchanges. I was very excited. That was all beauty. We can become friends very quickly. Other than this, the misunderstanding that the U.S. does not know enough China and does not know that we're not a threat. But behind that, I'm also, um, I have a philosophical concern. The differences and similarities in mankind. Everyone, all the scholars, when they talk about that, they, we, study, we study diversity and differences, but they forget the, the, um, the goal is to achieve um, to find common ground. There's someone I respect, Mr. Qian Zhongshu, he's passed away, he's a great scholar. He has a fundamental belief, as can be seen in um, his several writings, a basic tenet. Different appearances, same heart. In his opening to Tan Yi Lu, he said, East Sea, West Sea, East and West, we have the same hearts. We don't want disasters. We, we, we want beauty. We want art. We like art. You know, the dance, we immediately fell in love with it. We love literature, we love poetry, we love beauty. Isn't that the same? I don't see how it's different. We don't like ugliness. We don't like evil. We like compassion, honesty. So, so philosophically, we're stressing differences everywhere, but quite often I see people are the same everywhere. They can communicate. The third point, we should have an uh, adjust our, at, we should have the right attitude. <laughs> Harvard, uh, Professor Schwartz at Harvard University, he's passed away, he's, he's Jewish, he, has, he knew lots of languages. Um, during World War II, he decoded the, the Japanese um, plans He's, for his whole life. He advocated cross-cultural dialogue. What is dialogue? He said, he, culture is a loose concept. I said yesterday, to prove 
his um, belief. He said that language, the impact of different languages uh, um, is not as great as people think. People can communicate from different languages. And to me, the dialogue between cultures, it's not only a principle, it's life of life, it's, it's life itself. Our scholars, we have two kinds of uh, communications. We, as modern people, <coughs> we need to communicate with the with um, ancestors. As Chinese, we need to communicate with foreigners. The a must read list that I give students um, always include Aristotle. Oh, actually, Aristotle and Plato um, rank the on the top. Um, Haig, they, they are never out of date. Kango said morality has. Uh, morals have absolute value. Those classics will never be out of date. And another is my concern. We are not smart enough. Not, not we individually. Those people involved in politics, they're not, not being smart enough. They are um, polluted by interests. They become stupid. They don't know what's happening in the world. In the past five years, climate change is astounding. Many places, earthquakes, floods. When we had flood in the south, in the north, a unforgotten place, suddenly um, fire broke out. I see many uh, weather forecasts this, this uh, winter. Russia will have the coldest winter, and our north, um, east, and north of China will have similar situation. There are, there, are high, there are enough natural disasters in the world. Why can't people not resolve their conflicts? Uh, what's the big deal of their conflicts? Why don't they ref Why can't we self-reflect? We had um, human events that we do not want to remember. We condemn them, but how do we resolve um, hatreds, and how do we avoid uh, its accumulation? I think American politicians should think about this, but they don't. They think the most uh, powerful weapon to solve uh, human conflict. Uh, the, they think the way to resolve conflict is, is their powerful weapon, but is it? No, power, no political power can kill religion. Can you change religious beliefs? Why are these politicians not thinking about these things? As Chinese scholars, we feel mistreated. We don't, we really love, we love America. I can tell you my personal story. There was a great uh, caricature, Ding Chong, in China. He passed away today, I mean this year. He was wonderful. He painted, he drew so many um, figures, cultural figures, Qian Zhongshu, Ji Xianlin, those masters. But sometimes he makes mistakes and uh, he would draw me, he would draw, draw me as well. Uh, he has a rule, you have to say something and your wife says something. One or two of your good friends say something. What did I say? What I said was, let me tell you my secret. What I said is, 
Eat my McDonald's. I like um, uh, a, a famous courtesan in Ming Dynasty. I like her. I study Chinese culture. My wife is a writer. She's from Shanghai. She has a wish. When she becomes a president, she will change all Chinese restaurants into Western restaurants and eat cakes every day. To me, Chinese people are, have been very friendly to America. We like your country. We like your personality. Americans are very friendly and direct. And, you know, we, Chinese can be uh, <laughs> tricky. Why can't politicians take it, you know, utilize and, and expand on such likeness? And President Obama brings hope to America and to the world. He is popular because he wants to resolve conflicts. Of course, some of his opinions I probably would not support as an American either. For example, he wants to have a building somewhere. I, I, don't, believe, I don't agree with that. <laughs> That's too simplistic. I will say it. You know what it is. <laughs> In the, he did not actually implement his own beliefs. He's backtracking. It's unfortunate. So some people say the, that's for re-election. But we feel that's regretful. We want to have friendly relations. We have good relations with American scholars. If there are uh, bad feelings, uh, let's not get a divorce. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. And to the degree that this exchange will be between hamburgers and sweet and sour pork, <laughs> we're, we're the winners in receipt of your great aid. Uh, <laughs> Professor Blakely. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I must begin by thanking Chairman Leach for inviting me to participate in this wonderful event precisely because I'm not a China specialist. I think I've, I've had a unique uh, experience in the last couple of days. I've particularly enjoyed the rich exhibition of uh, Chinese art uh, yesterday. And now this morning I've danced serenade. <laughs> I'm also very happy uh, to be back in uh, Berkeley, where I spent most of the 1960s as a graduate student studying Russian history. My one concrete intervention in uh, these proceedings is, is very simple, and it's in some ways redundant. It, it's to repeat what I've seen borne out in all of the, what I've witnessed in the last uh, day and a half. And that is, rather than my trying to say anything about what the, the title of our, our panel is, the future of U.S. cultural relations with China, I want to emphasize the point that started out with the very first session yesterday, emphasizing the importance of connecting cultural relations to the rest. Everything that I've seen has convinced me further and further that, in fact, culture is more powerful than politics. And I hope any report uh, that comes as a result of these proceedings will emphasize that connection. Now, I will make uh, just a few remarks about my own historical uh, perspective that, that brings me uh, to this uh, point of view. I have written them out and, and will read it uh, 
in part uh, to resist the temptation of rambling off into a very long historical uh, discourse, and in part because uh, time is of the essence this morning. The 21st century is the first in which the entire world is challenged with new levels of cultural diversity within all the major societies. For example, my own current major research projects concerns the struggle of European societies to now deal with problems of race and identity that they once pretended were solely applicable to the United States, which was, after all, the only Western society that had actually practiced slavery at home. Now the European democracies that were the most deeply involved in the slave trade and colonization and in legal discrimination abroad are confronted with a high level of immigration they need in order to keep their economies vibrant. And for the first time, they're forced to cope with the same type of very real gap between the attitudes and practices of the traditional dominant group and full integration of the new non-European members of their societies consistent with their democratic ideals. In other words, the same dilemma the United States has been dealing with for over two centuries. And interestingly, some individuals and groups in Europe are looking to the United States for models, for guidance, at times under the false assumption that we've solved all those problems. As an historian who for more than three decades taught courses on comparative civilizations, I have remained in awe of the long duration of Chinese civilization, the philosophies and institutions it has shaped, and over the discovery that China actually had the technology and capacity to explore the whole world prior to the Europeans, and for various reasons elected not to. The most spectacular example of this were the exploits of Admiral Zheng He, who led seven expeditions abroad in the early 15th century, reaching as far as East Africa, the present day Middle East, and South Asia, with fleets numbering hundreds of ships and combined crews of tens of thousands. All this a century before the more widely known voyages of Christopher Columbus. One result of the later European voyages is that the Europeans ensured a greater cultural diversity for their future, even if not intended. Among other surprises for me, as I acquired a rudimentary knowledge of Chinese history, is that China, too, nevertheless, has a long history of managing cultural diversity. For example, Admiral Zheng He happened to be a Muslim. The Taiping Rebellion in the middle of the 19th century, around the same time as our devastating American Civil War. In the Taiping Rebellion, there was featured ethnic and religious conflict, and it resulted in a loss of some 20 million lives. A more recent uh, illustration, uh, there, there have been more recent illustrations, and uh, in the 20th century, as well, a number of issues that don't need to be detailed here. Meanwhile, we all know that the United States, in a much briefer history, spanning three centuries, has also produced a rich legacy of issues regarding cultural diversity, including the current special attention to immigration policy, and continuing resolution of long-standing challenges surrounding this concept of race and color prejudice. Based on this type of historical perspective, the question that I have for us is, are there not lessons that the United States and China can learn from each other concerning cultural diversity? We've witnessed over the past day and a half a tremendous amount of evidence regarding the power that cultural influences have manifested in both directions between our two countries. 
I hope we can persuade our respective leaders that this is a good foundation upon which to build mutual respect for cultural diversity and even more constructive engagement for strong international collaboration in place of contention over cultural issues. Thank you. Speaker will be uh, Jin Sung Rong, who's the Dean of the School of International Relations at Renmin University. Professor. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Leach. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to come to Berkeley. This, was, this is my fifth time, every time um, with great uh, memories. I am the only one who knows nothing about literature and art in this delegation. I study politics, and actually American politics I study quite, quite a lot, um, U.S.-China relations, more uh, from a political perspective. In terms of the future of the relations, cultural relations, I have three points. One is culture relations should should, uh, should be in the context of the entire relationships. From our point of view, there, I don't see any problems. From China's point of view, we have uh, placed great emphasis on the relation. In Mr. Jiang Zemin's time, in diplom diplomatic relations. Um, U.S. is the, the 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 most important of the most important, and then our Russian friends heard about that and they were not very happy. So we no longer say that openly. But Chinese sino U.S. relations still very important to us for two reasons. One is uh, as Mr. Liu said, um, our perception of the U.S. is positive over, in general. Um, professor Yu's school, there is a professor, another professor, um, Yang Yusheng. Um, China, uh, overall, our view of America is is positive. So from the perception, we have good perception of you. Even though, although you know, we we sometimes have some temper, just like you have some um, disagreement with your president as well. Secondly, uh, the reason is is uh, out of interest. In the past three decades of opening. Um, the reform has been by and large been successful, and, and um, it's uh, unlike um, the reform in Russia, we, um, we emphasized um, reconciliation and collaboration. So the Sino-U.S. relations has been has played a big part in this process. We have benefited from these relations. So in the future, it's still important to us. Now the world is globalizing. We have the, our interdependence is reaching a new height. Last year, trade value last year uh, was $440 billion. Among the 192 UN members, bilateral relations that have this level. Uh, only exists between U.S. and Canada and U.S. and China. So we can't live without each other. That's out of um, interest. So the perception and the interest, if you put the two together, to me, um, in the future, 
the status of U.S. can only go higher to us. So to us, uh, the problems between the two countries come not from our attitude, but from Americans' attitude, and perhaps a third party. So that's my bold, bold projection. Now back to our topic. Uh, there are four pillars to the U.S.-China relationships, economic, pol political, military, and security. Uh, the fourth is cultural, social and cultural. Among the four, I think personally, among the four, um, we we both compete and collaborate. In politics, you know, we we have political different political systems. We have ideological differences. But in the political arena, we have uh, uh, lots of room for collaboration. For example, we have. Common, we face common uh, global issues, climate change. The two of us on CO2 emission, we, uh, we share the championship in CO2 relation, re emission. Of course, we try to give the other one that title. So we, we have um, a special responsibility on, on that, both of us. Then uh, non-proliferation, anti-terrorism, um, piracy, uh, SARS, uh, pu public health. We can't solve those problems uh, unilaterally. We have to join hands. So despite our differences, we have common challenges to have to deal with together. Military and security, that may be a little more complicated. I am a little concerned given the uh, Taiwan uh, issue. So, but um, the political relationships and security relations improve, um, we can co cooperate more. So those two pillars between competition and cooperation, competition is probably, will probably dominate. On the other hand, the other two pillars, economy and culture, probably there will be more cooperation than competition. Even though we have economic friction or trade frictions, there have been uh, lots of uh, uh, conflict in terms of the exchange rate. But overall, um, the trade relationship will be important to both of us. And the fourth in cultural uh, relationship, it's probably a stabilizing, a stabilizing force as well. So the, this one is probably the most stable uh, and most impo important factor in stabilizing the relationship. So we have to admit that up to today, um, politics have been dominating in the relationship. You know, China is, is very political, and so is the U.S. So up to today, today um, cultural relations have not been independent of, of the political context. But in the future, we should rely more upon um, cultural and social relations. I suggest that, uh, that um, I hope we can try to delink those four pillars so that they don't um, interfere with each other. Lastly, I have a suggestion between the two of us, our cultural scholars. Perhaps we can work together to, to um, dig deeper and, and find more common grounds on social and cultural levels. Common interest can be, um, has been the beginning point, but now, now perhaps socially, culturally, we can we can seek more common grounds and common beliefs. Um, I can think of a few that that that's worth exploring. 
Socially, um, China scholars or China hands, um, you know, the two societies are similar that that uh, they are big and diverse and share the same work ethics. The Chinese diversity you can you can see uh, from our cuisines. We have eight major cuisines, and we are discovering secondary cuisines, sub cuisines as well. We have the southerners and the northerners are quite different. You know, the northerners are more like uh, Mon Mongolians, where the southerners are more like Malays. The difference between Beijing <laughs> dialect and uh, Cantonese is greater than even some of the European, Eastern European languages. So we have great diversity, just like in the U.S. Another um, is the work ethics. We work hard. That's something we share in common. Um, so yeah, in the U.S. is the Protestant work ethics. In China, we have a spirit. That, that comes from the, the gentleman's um, self, continuous self improvement. Um, the reason that the four little dragons became successful. The Eastern countries. Um, have been successful, it can be largely attributed to that worth ethics. So in our natural characters, we have lots of commonalities, but some of them on the man-made systems, we have more differences. So we have some common traits culturally. We are both very pragmatic. Pragmatism is your national philosophy. And this is our natural philosophy. We don't even need to study it. Face up. Uh, the Chinese religions, the, in religions, the gods are useful, are practical. And individualism, um, which is religious belief in, in America, we're naturally individualistic. We're different from the Japanese. We'd rather be the head of the chicken rather than the tail of the phoenix. That's our individualism. Another one is a cultural tolerance which is based on self-confidence. Our history, like Professor Yu said yesterday, there are th Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism are, are compatible. In America, um, diversity has been tolerated. In addition, um, our motivating system, motivating, uh, we, we both are, are very good at motivating propaganda. When your President Clinton was was running for president. It was, it's the economy, uh, stupid. When it come, Obama had changed. In China, we have some very short, concise slogans as well. This is a big difference with uh, more kind of homogenous societies, such as Korea or Japan. Another, both 
both countries um, value simple values. Uniting people on interest alone will not work because interest is exclusive. It's win-lose. So if you motivate the society with interest, in diverse societies like ours, it's very limiting. So we have to have values. In China, uh, it's more rule of morality. In the U.S., it's more rule of the law. But, but there's something in common between those. So those are the high-level conclusions. I think the two societies will naturally we have natural-born similarities that should be explored further. We have on deeper cultural level we have similarities as well. We talked uh, enough about differences. So we should maybe perhaps we can reserve some of our energy um, on finding the common commonalities. That's probably going to be beneficial to uh, the future of the relations. Thank you, Professor. We will uh, conclude this panel with uh, Professor Ober. Well, I wanted to once again thank Chairman Leach and the organizers of this um, uh, excellent gathering. Uh, my uh, fields, my academic fields, um, are political science and humanities, and so I'll attempt to bring these two together. Speaking as a political scientist, I think we must face the fact that China and the United States are both great powers, great powers that will indeed compete but must also, as my fellow panelists have said, must also find a way to cooperate. Power will be part of the relationship, um, any future relationship between the US and China. The question is, is what sort of power will be exemplary? How will we sort of use power? And I think that as Xin Kanrong has already suggested, we need to find ways for that power to be cultural power, the soft power, as Joseph Nye talked about, um, rather than the hard power of military um, uh, and economic sanctions. So imagine, just take a little trip with me um, uh, across uh, much of uh, Europe, start, say, in Italy, move to France, go across to Britain, to Germany, to Romania, um, to Greece, to Albania, um, and tra uh, cross over um, into Africa, um, visit Egypt and Libya, Algeria, Morocco. In that trip, you will have seen remarkable diversity. Um, you'll see many different cultures. Um, on the surface, these different cultures will look awfully, awfully different. And yet underneath all of that diversity, there is, in fact, a substratum of similarity. If you look at the archaeological levels, if you visit the great archaeological sites of Pompeii, or of Lyon, of Bath, of Lepsis Magna, of Sufetla, and so on, you'll see the same basic Roman stratum, Roman architecture. The cities of these remarkably diverse places once all looked very much the same. So Rome was a civilization, um, arguably the West's one claim to actually have a really world-class civilization, the one time that the West really equaled China in terms of having a uh, really extensive world uh, civilization. Uh, the Roman Empire was famous for its hard power, um, for its legionaries, for its armies. And yet, the Roman Empire was clearly sustained by soft power, um, uh, by the culture and the institutions of the empire, by the language 
are the many, several languages that become common to the Roman Empire by a common architecture, by a common system of law, by literature, um, and by art, both visual art and performing art. Well, Roman culture, in turn, was a product of soft power. Uh, Roman culture was borrowed from, or perhaps we would say, was a product of the takeover of Rome, um, the cultural, uh, or at least partial, integration um, of Greek, uh, 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 Greek culture um, uh, in the Roman world. So a lot of what we think of as Roman culture was in fact, as the Romans knew very well, borrowed from the Greeks. It was a form of soft power um, a conquest, uh, one might say. So literature, once again, performance, language, even the alphabet, um, uh, mythology, the very understanding of what it was to be civilized was at least in part for the Romans, a product of this soft power relationship um, between uh, Greece and Rome. Where does Greek culture come from? Once again, um, it's not all just indigenous. It didn't just begin in Greece. Um, there were soft power relations between what is now Iraq, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Um, the Greek culture um, was in its own part um, borrowed from, uh, part of an interchange with other great civilizations. Greek culture crystallized in a brilliant epoch that we call the classical period, exemplified especially in Athens. This was a time in which history, drama, philosophy, as we in the West now understand it, were first developed. Um, it's a period in which the very conception of what it is to be human was transformed all under the context uh, of a distinctive political system, a system with distinctive institutions, democratic institutions, uh, which celebrated the possibility of human freedom and the participation of both rich people and poor people in creating um, a common civilization. Well, the soft power institutions and culture of Athens, of Greece, and Rome have succeeded in transforming their world because it was the, these cultural forms and these institutions were deeply attractive. People were attracted by the possibilities that, of this culture, of these um, institutions. After visiting Athens or Rome, people in the ancient world found that they, they wanted some of that culture. They saw um, value um, in those uh, institutions, and therefore, these cultures spread. So that's, that's how soft power really works. Um, not by force, not by intruding upon, but by attraction, by making something that is, once again, beautiful, um, as opposed to ugly, that is good, as opposed to evil, um, uh, that shares something that people from different cultures can recognize as fine and excellent. That's how soft power works. And uh, soft power ultimately works, if it, when it does, um, in a way that is persistent. So Greek and Roman culture and institutions, although no longer absolutely dominant in the West, remain highly influential in the West, remain foundational in many ways for the Western world, and they've also traveled very widely. They're not as an not owned by the West. They're not a unique um, a cultural attribute of the West. Um, they were, of course, highly influential in the Islamic world and have traveled easily to South and East Asia as well. Aristotle and Plato are read by Chinese scholars as well as by Western scholars. So soft power, I think, um, gives us a way to think about uh, an interrelationship between great powers uh, that is indeed, in some sense, competitive as well as cooperative, but it doesn't need, it need not in any way uh, involve the hard power, need not involve uh, a force. Um, I think that power will inevitably be part of the U.S.-Chinese relations in the future, 
But I think that what we in this room can call for and hope for is ways in which that soft power relationship um, is the one that is put to the fore, um, is uh, uh, put to the front. Um, unlike hard power, there is no need for soft power to seek hegemony. Soft power relations need not be zero sum. The Romans were not the losers uh, when they adopted Greek culture. Um, the Greeks were not the losers when they adopted the culture of Mesopotamia and Egypt. And likewise, I think Chinese people are not the losers when they lead, uh, learn uh, something from Plato and Aristotle. Western scholars are not losers when we incorporate the study of Chinese language, of Confucian tradition, um, of uh, the history uh, of China into our traditions. Um, when the soft power, um, the attractive, the beautiful things of Chinese culture are more recognized in the West, just as the beautiful things of the Western culture have been re uh, recognized uh, in China, I think the possibility for a kind of creative competition um, and ultimately for building um, a world uh, in which not only um, is there greater understanding, um, but there is uh, a greater um, uh, integration um, of what is finest uh, and most enduring um, in our traditions. That, I think, ultimately is what I would hope for, for the future of Chinese-American cultural relations. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to have 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll bring this to a conclusion. Uh, do we have a first question? Yes, sir. I'm a visiting scholar from China. I would like to ask Mr. Liu. Yesterday, you um, mentioned that the future of the well, there are lots of crises, and you mentioned how um, cultures can coexist um, non-confrontationally. Can you elaborate how we, how from a cultural perspective, uh, how we should face such crises? I don't really have the time to elaborate, but yesterday in my speech and also the speech today, I basically have um, um, talked about my view. Today, we do face crises, natural ones, as we all know. And also, the other one is perhaps many people don't see it. I will mention it. The um, political paradigm today, the destructive weapon proliferation um, is far greater than the World I and World II era. This is very dangerous. And lots of people are threatening with military might. Big countries are threatening, small countries are threatening as well. They learned, they learned, at, they learned it as a way, the hard power to resolve conflicts. That's not civilization. It's non-civilization. This, this is a crisis, a, severe, a serious crisis. I don't see enough American scholars um, speaking up against that. That voice, I would expect the most from uh, American scholars. They have been outspoken, but in the past I have not heard enough. It's a dangerous world. So in that sense, I'm, I don't agree to Professor Jin as four pillar, four pillars. So I don't know if of the, I feel that they, the collision between the four pillars should be, try to, uh, we try to prevent that. The 
the barbaric um, confrontations. We have all, so, so many different kind of greater wisdom to avoid these confrontations, which is not in the interest in anyone. I think there are too many crises in humankind, which is exceeding um, all history, and I'm hearing enough voice. I have the opportunity to, to raise my point here today. In my institute, I have some great scholars, Professor Fan, Professor Liang, uh, who's a legal scholar and other international scholars. We quite often discuss these things. In the past six months, uh, I have been gravely concerned. I think we are not estimating it enough, both natural and man, man, uh, uh, artificial crises. The latter especially not seen enough. If, um, if philosophers see it, they should speak up. If professors see it, they should speak up. We should all pursue a more beautiful future. Thank you. Time for one more question. Yes, Claire. Hi, um, Claire Kinsesen. I want to just offer a question that maybe complicates things a little bit because I'm very appreciative of, of the panelists' um, contributions. But I guess I see things in a little more complex terms. Um, in my own study of the relationship between the U.S. and China as exhibited through theater, my first book was about how Americans are portrayed on stage in China and how the U.S.-China relationship is figured on stage. Um, I found it to be quite complex and, and not simply positive or negative and that it, it shifts over time. And I think that, um, I guess the, the listing of cultural and social um, relationship between U.S. and China as the fourth in a list coming after um, political, military, and economic, and also the idea that culture is soft power on one hand makes it seem um, friendly and, and full of potential and hope, but on the other hand, I think it minimizes its uh, value and impact. And I think all of us here today believe that culture is a terribly um, wonderful but powerful thing. And it, it, it topples regimes. It changes people's minds and hearts, as Liu Mengxi mentioned. Uh, it can do things. You know, the Cultural Revolution started with a play. And um, a lot of other uh, both tumultuous and very positive things begin with our cultural representations of each other. Um, whether they're important, um, you know, be, whether a novel becomes a classic and is read by people across the globe, or whether a play becomes commercially successful and gets exported or imported, uh, you know, across cultures. So I, I just wanted to know if anybody wanted to comment on that, the fact that um, that we all want our relationship to be friendly and positive, but that it's a terribly fragile thing, and that culture can assist in this effort, um, but can also do damage, and that as and that we as as custodians of culture and art need to take that seriously. Thank you. Does anyone want to comment? Well, Professor Ober. Very briefly, I would say that it's extremely important to remember that soft power is power. Um, and power is power to do good and power to do harm. Um, and so when I say that uh, we should think about culture in terms of soft power, just because it's soft power doesn't mean that it's some sort of you know, mushy, um, uh, ineffective power. Indeed, I think all, arguably some of the most profound changes of the world, the changes that you see in the archaeological record as genuinely persistent, are in fact the results of what we're calling soft power rather than um, the results of um, uh, violence. And so, yes, I think we have to be very um, uh, aware of uh, when we're talking about culture as soft power, that we're talking about meaningful um, uh, use of power uh, and power that ultimately, um, if it's not used for good, um, can be used for harm. Well, thank you very much. We'll bring this to an end, and let me just uh, conclude by noting there's a lot of references to history, and that two and a half millennia ago, we had uh, Sophocles, Euripides, and uh, 
We also had uh, Buddha and we also had Confucius and their high and low moments in history and uh, the challenge is to make this one a high one uh, with uh, the inspiration of the past. And I want to uh, thank each and every one of you and, and uh, thank all the panelists and I uh, wish you all well. Thank you.